I, 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 you know, full disclosure, I'll just say, uh, I, I really have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to Zen, <laughs> I think that's what it's about. Not really knowing exactly what you're talking about, but, uh, you know, exploring that and, try, and trying to, uh, you know, understand that. Um, you know, Zen to me, uh, you know, what I want to, you know, address is, you know, the way I see Zen, uh, like in my everyday, uh, what are, what's the everyday experience of, of, of walking through Zen? And, uh, you know, to, it, to me, it's really like, um, well, you know, if you, it, I read a, a book a few years back when it first came out, uh, Michael Pollan's How to Ch Change Your Mind. And it was interesting, you know, it's, it's a book that's really about um, tripping, you know, psilocybin mushrooms and uh, LSD. And it's a very you know, academic approach to what's going on in, in, in your mind when you're tripping and when you're taking these drugs. And um, he, he talked, you know, a lot about, uh, you know, there was uh, psychologists or psychiatrists and neurologists who were studying the brain and looking at uh, what areas of the brain are affected when you're tripping. And they, they kind of isolated it to a section of the brain that really identifies with ego. When you're tripping, you know, you're suppressing this part of the brain that identifies with ego. And, you know, if you think about it, people talk about, you know, having a bad trip or being on a bad trip. And what's the thing they're, they're always saying? They're saying, I don't know who I am. I, I, I've lost all sense of who I am. And, uh, you know, they find they're, 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 they're confused and it scares them, um, you know, because the ego is being suppressed. And then I found that, you know, that's an interesting contract, be, contrast because they also said in the same book, Michael Paul was pointing out that if you look at the brains, when the neurologists look at the brains of meditators, they find the same part of the brain being affected, being suppressed, uh, this part of the brain that uh, deals with and identifies ego. And I was listening to Mark Epstein, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the, the Buddhist uh, psychiatrist, and he was talking and he was saying, um, you know, he, he talks about ego, like ego is not a thing. It's not a noun, you know? I mean, we think of it as a noun. We use it as a noun all the time, but he, he talks about it like it's a verb, it's a process. And, and, and he calls it the process of seeking certainty. And that, you know, I think that's a really good explanation of what's going on there, seeking certainty and defining certainty and imposing certainty uh, as a way of interacting with the world. It's a lot of what uh, the ego interaction is. And yet in Zen, and what I struggle to learn and understand more all the time is, is how uh, Zen helps me not impose that ego on the world, but be open to uh, seeing the world in a more in a more unfolding and creative way. We we just went through the um, you know we just did uh, for the past month we, uh, we were looking at the Bodhisattva vows, and in one of the discussions I think I brought up you know I always see the vows as sort of like a story that unfolds you know a four chapter story. Uh, you know, the first um, vow is talking about numberless creations. I vow to receive. And uh, numberless, you know, it's, it's basically saying, you know, being open to the people, being open to the Dharma, being open to what's around us. But it's also, you know, numberless creations. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's things that are creating themselves then and there as we encounter them. Every experience that we have with the Dharma, with whomever, with people, it's really us creating a relationship, uh, us creating an interaction uh, in that moment. And then you take that part of the story and, and, and you move to, um, you know, the next vow, inexhaustible delusions, I vow to dissolve. You know, part of encountering the Dharma, part of encountering the world, is encountering and creating delusions. And delusions are as much teachers as uh, 
you know, the Dharma itself. And so, you know, it's it, the different, the thing is, it's, it's this, it's this challenge of recognizing uh, the delusions, uh, seeing the delusions, and, uh, and opening to the delusions, understanding what they are. I mean, delusions are sort of the great source of, uh, you know, humor in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, I, I, I welcome delusions because they can be so entertaining. And, and then, you know, omnipresent Dharma gates um, is really saying that, you know, the Dharma is both the encounterings that we're having, that we're creating with, uh, you know, the, the uh, numberless creations, but also with the delusions that we're experiencing. And uh, one really depends upon the other. I, and that's, that's, the, that's the tension of learning in my mind and, and, and in my experience. You know, Zen, Zen is, is it's, a, it's a process of then embracing uncertainty. Um, you know, it's a process of kind of rolling with the punches. Uh, difficulties arise, uh, things that are hard to fathom, things that seem, you know, insurmountable. And yet, uh, you know, Zen's a great tool for kind of just learning how to, how to roll with it. And that's, that's been a lot of its experience for me. Um, it's been a real um, survival tool, survival strategy for getting through uh, what are regular occurrences of difficult times and the occasional occurrences of really difficult times. And I appreciate that about it. I, I, that's, that's like a thing that, um, that's the thing that's always challenged me to, you know, to understand, to find out more, to dig in a little bit more about uh, Zen in my own personal life and, and how I'm interacting with it. I kind of, you know, um, what, what I mean is, is that, you know, Zen's that thing of, of having no expectation, of approaching the world without any real fixed expectation. And, and just seeing, and, and, and by doing that, I think, you know, and I, I've thought about Buddhism like this for a long time. Buddhism is the art of seeing the world as it is without the expectation and without the overlay of ego on top of it. Um, you know, and I struggle with it. I'm not saying that it's a, a simple thing, but I, I, I struggle with it. But at the same time, uh, you know, it, how do, you know, it, I struggle because I, I, I wonder how it is I can ever really let go of ego. Isn't ego there, present all the time? When, you know, when you, when you're, talking about these people on LSD who are saying that they're having a bad trip um, because they don't know who they are. They've lost that identification. In some ways, I think what's happening is, is that, no, they still are holding on to a little bit of that identification. There's still that person who's saying, I don't know who I am. There's still that I. I don't know who I am. Um, they kind of uh, are, are holding back. They're, they're taking an expectation of, you know, what it, what this experience should be, what uh, it, and it should be something that's still about the me, about the ego, and uh, you know I think there's a lesson in that for you know approaching Zen. How do you ever really um, take your ego out of the experience? Um, I struggle with that. I don't know. And I don't know that I need to. I mean, I think sometimes it is, um, that's one of the delusions that we learn to live with. That's one of the entertainments that we, uh, that, that teach us. To see, to see, you know, what really is, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, a dynamic struggle with imperfection. And it's the challenge of accepting imperfection. And it's the challenge of, you know, recognizing that, you know, all things are a little bit flawed. Uh, I was reading in the paper today, there was an event in uh, Los Angeles, and it was at a, it, it was at a, a center. Um, I don't know if it was a Zen center or a Buddhist center in Los Angeles, um, but it was sort of down in the Japanese neighborhood, you know, outside of downtown LA. And uh, it was called the Lotus Flower Ceremony. And what, and what it was about was it was a, you know, a bunch of different um, Buddhist groups getting together to have this ceremony 
to dig into, to cope with, to understand, to um, maybe wrestle our way out of a lot of the uh, prejudices and a lot of the uh, events that we've seen going on in our country lately. And the person who organized the event was being interviewed and, and he was talking about it. And he was, was talking about, you know, in a lot of ways, we're kind of learning our own lesson here because we have so many different groups that never interact here in Los Angeles, so many different Buddhist groups that never really interact. And here we've all come together, um, breaking down some of our own prejudices amongst ourselves. And then he went into the whole idea of, you know, the lotus flower how the lotus flower doesn't really, you know, survive uh, just in pure water. Um, it would die in pure water, but it survives in, you know, muddy water, uh, in swampy water, and that's what provides its nutrients. And, uh, and the lesson, you know, that he was kind of bringing out is, is that it, it's not like we can ever say we know we've accomplished our goal when we get rid of the prejudice that's in the world or when we get rid of the hate that's in the world, because that is always going to be there as our challenge, as our contradiction. And that's where we, um, that's how we learn. And that's how the flower blossoms. And that's how we get closer in my life, you know, how I get closer to Zen by living in, in with and in and, and then through the imperfections, by engaging the imperfections. Again, you know, Mark Epstein, I was listening, like I said, to this talk that he had given. And, um, you know, he, and, he, and he was talking about uh, how at one time he and Jack Kornfeld and you know, a number of different Buddhist celebrities had, had all been traveling through Asia and had gone to um, meet with Jack Kornfeld's teacher. And they were saying, well, we, when we approach the teacher. We need to have some questions. And, uh, you know, we should come up with some questions and they, and they did and they went to meet with the teacher and they were asking him different things. And at one point, the teacher just sort of cut him off and he picked up a glass that he was drinking water out of. And he said to him, you know, this glass, I, I, I love this glass. I love this glass because, you know, it lets me drink water. And I love this glass because I hold it up to the light and, and the light refracts through it. And I see how the light breaks up and it's many different things. And I love this glass because you know, I can tap it with my pen and it makes a sound, you know? And uh, I really, uh, you know, appreciate that about this glass. But at the same time, this glass sitting here on my table, I could knock this over and it would fall to the ground and it would break. And then it wouldn't be there for any of those things anymore. And he, and he was saying, you know, that's the way I approach, uh, that's the way I approach life, like the glass is already broken. Because the glass being broken is the thing that brings out uh, how precious it is now in this moment. Uh, and, and I thought, you know, I mean, I came to Zen th through meditation. I mean, I was meditating for quite a while and then discovered Zen and, and was meditating for quite a while and then discovered Nalanda Bodhi before that. And, you know, I, I was meditating and probably uh, imperfectly and, you know, I was kind of like, you know, I, I, I could strike the pose, I could sit on the cushion, I could look like I was meditating. But the whole time I'm wondering, is this really what it is? Is this what I'm doing now? Is this is this meditating? And uh, you know, how do you know? How do you go to a how do you, how do you go to someone and say, you see this thing that's going on in my head now when I'm sitting here? Is this is this what it means to meditate? And and, and you know, when I would ask teachers about it, they would say, well, you know, it'll it'll be obvious to you when you're meditating. And it'll be obvious when you're not meditating. But it and I I didn't know what that meant until I did. Uh, and there was, a, you know, there was a period in my life when it was really uh, a difficult time I was going through, and uh, my wife and I were uh, splitting up. And uh, I was meditating, and uh, I had one particular meditation session where I was sitting, and I could really, 
I, my, I really was opening up to, wow, what's the part I played in this breakup? What, what did I contribute to this relationship falling apart? And uh, I was able to, you know, see, that, you know, it stripped away a lot of the ego. It stripped away a lot of the protections that I had built around myself and the way I had defined myself. And I could look at myself and see myself and at the same time, see my fault, but without shame or blame. It was really just sort of an opening to, yes, here's what had happened. And here's who I was in these instances. And here's who I am now. Um, and that's not to say, uh, that's not to say you need to suppress that. You need to not try to be that. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Uh, meditation, when I knew I was meditating, was the act of really accepting that and seeing that and being honest with myself about that. Uh, and, you know, it's really like, you know, the glass is already broken. You know, seeing the relationship that was falling apart was really the thing that helped us, my wife and I, both to say, you know, this that we're going through now is difficult and painful, but it shouldn't negate everything that happened before this, which was all really good, good relationship. Um, you know, there's a preciousness that you recognize when the thing is when the thing is breaking. That's just a, I don't know, to me, that was a real lesson. That's when I really started to think of, uh, okay, here's what I think I, I think I have a grasp. I think I have an understanding on what meditation is, and it's not about defining something specific, but it's about questioning. It's about being open to the question. And that's my you know, experience of Zen that I try to bring into uh, everyday life, you know? Um, the, fir the first Zen book I ever read, it really wasn't a Zen book at all. It was, it was this book here, it's called The uh, Centered Skier. In, uh, I think it came out in like 70, late 70s, written by uh, Denise McClugich. I think that's how you say her name, McClugich. I started reading it in the 80s. I've had this copy ever since. It's not really about skiing. I mean, it is about skiing. It's not about here's the mechanics of skiing. It's about here's the gestalt of skiing. Here's the experience of skiing. And um, it was just a... You know, for some, I mean, I was learning, I was older, you know, I was 32 when I first started to ski, but it really kind of um, opened me up to, uh, this book helped me really kind of understand, here's why you want to ski. And, and she has this, this chapter, this little section here, she's, it's called Skiing is Falling. Perhaps in a simpler world, being afraid of something would be a reason enough to avoid it, but certainly not so with skiing. Consider that the very nature of skiing is essentially a fall, a long controlled fall from the mountaintop to the mountain base. Perhaps in that balancing of fearful falling and controlled descent is the source of the pleasure of skiing. There are many, many rescues inherent in every run that deliver us unscathed, but that still leave us in close acquaintanceship with the brink and you know that's that i think that i mean you know it's so true you know you take a ski run and there's all those little moments where you almost bite it but you don't uh it's it's that it's the exhilaration of being you know in control and on the brink in control but almost out of control uh, it's it's that little you know razor's edge that you that you that you you're going on. Um, it's an openness, you know. It's 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 sort of like the irrational experience of this current moment that I'm in, uh, where I'm not thinking about the last moment, and I don't want to think about the next moment. I just want to kind of stay in this zone where I am, because that's how you get down to the bottom of the mountain.
you know, one thing about skiing too is that, uh, and, and one thing about, you know, I kind of like fast, you know, I kind of like things that are fast. Skiing's fast. Uh, I like bicycling. Bicycling's fast. Um, you know, there's a lot of things about fast that are, 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 are really kind of about just riding the momentum, you know, and, and, and being on that brink, being on that edge. Um, you know, because half of it is riding the momentum and half of it is the, the, uh, the momentum riding you. And uh, I don't know, there's something about uh, doing, doing fast that uh, I think that's a little bit zen. I think, uh, you know, that experience uh, is uh, an awakening, a, a creating of the moment. Uh, Corey mentioned that I, that I write, I, I do, I write fiction. And, um, you know, there's a, like, sort of a lesson in, in, in writing fiction uh, about, you know, writing fast. You know, you certainly want to know where you're going, and, but, you, but uh, you know, when you're ever, whenever you're stuck, write fast, just write, just, just start writing and see what there, where that takes you. Don't expect it to take you someplace. Don't go into it with an expectation. Go into it with um, an exploration of where it's going to take you. And you know, everything is, has, is Zen, right? So Ray Bradbury wrote this book, uh, The Zen of the Art of Writing. And uh, it's, I, I read it a long time ago, but it's a pretty good book. I really like it. And, and he kind of talks about this uh, and he's talking about this for writers. Run fast, stand still. This is the lesson we learn from lizards. For all writers, observe almost any survival creature and you see the same, jump, run, freeze. In the ability to flick like an eyelash, crack like a whip, vanish like steam, hear this instant, gone the next, life teems the earth. When that life is not rushing to escape, it is playing statue to do the same, to escape. See the hummingbird, there, not there. As thought arises and blinks off, so this thing of summer vapor, the clearing of the cosmic throat, the fall of a leaf, and where it was, now a whisper. In quickness is truth. You know, I, I kind of, um, I mean, what I, you know, Zen, to, like writing, is, 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 that, is that creating of that instant moment that you're in. Uh, you know, I, and, and I get a lot of that, you know, I, I mean, talk about skiing, talk about biking, but I get a lot of that from reading. I mean, I'm a writer because of how much I enjoy reading. Uh, I enjoy reading because, you know, that's a creative experience. You know, any book is really sort of an imperfect outline. It's a blueprint. It's a blueprint of a story. And the story gets built by the reader, by the reader who's the architect, who is interacting with that book. You know, um, the, the reader is the one who's really creating the story in their own mind. And that makes every reading experience an intimate experience of the moment. Uh, and it makes it a different experience for every reader who picks up that same book and reads it. And that's sort of, uh, you know, that's a beautiful experience. You know, you, you, read, a, you read a brief little passage and it, and it sparks for you. It kind of like, you know, makes you jump, makes you think, oh, you go back and reread it and maybe you don't have the same experience. I mean, I have a whole bunch of books on my bookshelf that I'm purging because I read and enjoyed and had those spark moments while I was reading it and then picked up years later and started reading and I says, oh, you know, it's not the same experience. You know, you don't repeat experiences that are that unique um, and you just appreciate them uh, for you know their preciousness that that was but now they're broken now now, now they're you know now they're no longer the same that they were and 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 you know you read a passage and you know there's that you know that other spark where you're reading something and before you finish it the sentence you know oh this is where it's going or this is what where it's what it's going to say and then, lo and behold, you get to the end of the sentence, the end of the paragraph, and there it is. That's what it said, you know. And there's a little bit of magic in that. There's a little bit of spark in that. Uh, that's a creative experience. It's almost like a, a deja vu, you know. Um, you know, 
you read you read a, you read a passage and, and and it creates a sentiment you know where you cry or you laugh about it uh and and that's that's a magic um it's just that interaction you know it's that there's no book there's no reader there's the shared experience that goes in between the two that to me is um that that, that to me is a lot of uh what i get in an everyday experience of zen you know for me, for me, Zen is sort of like, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's wonder, it's seeing the world as it is, seeing what is, it's speedy. I like that speedy part. And, and, and it's an exhilaration that pinpoints and creates an exact moment. Uh, and, and I think about that, you know, as, as I go through, uh, you know, the encounters that I have with people and the encounters that I'm having as I just go about my day. Uh, you know, when I looked out, you know, this morning and saw the uh, cherry blossom tree, you know, completely in flower. I mean, that's a magic moment, you know? It only happens a little bit every year. And sometimes it doesn't happen because it snows <laughs> uh, in, at this time of year, you know? So, you know, that's it. Um, and, and so, you know, I, Zen informs each of these things that I do, but Zen is also informed by my skiing and my reading and my and and, and my encounters with people. And uh, and 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 to me, um, you know, Zen is the action, is the activity that kind of circulates with all these other activities and brings them out full because there's really no contradiction. There's really no this and then that. It's 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 an integration. And, and, and the integration is really just an openness to uh, not knowing, you know, not, not knowing. Um, I, I uh, you know, I like to, uh, you know, every once in a while when I'm looking for something to read, I always have something that I am reading, you know, the project read. But uh, sometimes it's good to just pick up with something and, and kind of, you know, go through that. And, I, I do that with this book. Um, it, the raft is not the shore. It's a uh, it's a conversation. It's a dialogue between uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and Daniel Berrigan. Um, Daniel Berrigan was a guy who, when I was in college and thereafter, I mean, I read a lot of his books. He was sort of a Jesuit radical priest in the uh, anti-war movement, um, and I had worked as a uh, conscientious objector counselor. Uh, during, at that time, and uh, Daniel Berrigan was a big influence on me. And, and I just thought, you know, I mean, I can't say that the book is particularly profound, but I can say that it's a particularly interesting experience to watch two great minds have a conversation with one another, uh, and, and how much I appreciate that. And there's a point in the book where, you know, where the first time I read this, well, I'll read it, and then we know so little of what we know. We have such a narrow conception of how the human soul operates. And, you know, when I first read it, I thought, well, that's kind of a bummer, you know? I mean, we don't really know what we know, and the human soul, we don't know. But then I thought about it, and, and I would go back and read it again, and now I read it, you know, because it's really kind of saying, yeah, you know, everything's a question. Everything's like what we don't know. Everything is the willingness to encounter uncertainty, um, to drop the ego. You know, if 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 ego uh, as a, is is um, seeking certainty, uh, you know, for me, Zen in everyday life is really um, not seeking uncertainty, but embracing uncertainty as it occurs and just kind of rolling with the punches. So I don't know, that's what I was thinking about. And uh, I appreciate you listening and thanks very much for, for coming. Thanks.